The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Now what's so, uh, what's so wonderful about the 51st Psalm is that you really don't have to know a whole lot of Bible, but if someone comes to you and their heart's broken, they want to get right with God and they want to pray and they want to confess their sin, they want to repent, uh, Psalm 51 is a good place to take them. Now remember this about the Old Testament. I don't know of a verse of scripture in the Old Testament that doesn't lay the foundation for coming to Christ. You see, you've got that Old Testament. You lay the foundation, then you bring them to Christ. Isaiah 53, Philip, understandest thou what thou readest? How can I? And so when he took the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, became the foundation, where did he take him? He took him to Christ. He preached Jesus to him from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. The 51st chapter of, I, of a Psalm, it's important to understand this. David was a sinner. We all know his sins. He had a fleshly problem. He certainly did. He lusted after women. And he also tried to cover up this by murder. So we know David is a murderer and we know that he's, a, he's an adulterer, a fornicator, and all the rest of it. David's sins were sins of the flesh. But there's no question in my mind, if you read Psalm 51 with an open heart, he got right with God. And see, this is the great thing you can offer to anyone in this world. There's a lot of people out there who feel like they've, they've sinned and there's no hope for them. Yes, there is. It's the person who has sinned and has no bother. It doesn't bother him anymore. The conscience is seared like a hot iron. That's the one to worry about. But the man out here who has sin that's eating him alive, you can help that man and you can take him to Psalm 51. Now these are wonderful things that are said here. And I'm laying a foundation for you tonight. He said in verse number one, have mercy upon me. Well, mercy is an element of repentance, isn't it? Repent, this is repentance that you're reading in Psalm 51, folks. This is not high theology. This is plain and simple to the heart and to the soul. A man broken hearted, confessing, pouring out his soul before God. And he said, Lord, have mercy on me. Then in verse two, he said, cleanse me. Look at verse number seven. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The apostle John said he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin is a corrupting thing. And once left upon someone, if he didn't cleanse you of it, you could still come under the stench of it and the damnation of it, you see. Therefore, when to be forgiven is to be cleansed. Thanks be unto God for that. At verse number 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Well, I'm going to tell you something. What David has said here in these verses from Psalm chapter number 51 is as theological as any preacher you ever heard in your life. He doesn't profess to be a preacher, but he's covering the elements of repentance, the things that are necessary. Look at verse number three. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I own up to it. I did, I did it. I'm not blaming anyone else. I did it. And that's a part, that's an element of repentance until you own up to it and accept the fact that you did it. You'll never repent. Then in verse number four, look what he said about the Lord. Against the only have I sinned, done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified. God is just. He is just. Don't ever come to a man, confess your sins, and expect to get justice. Don't ever come to a man and confess your sins, period. Confess them to God. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. I've never met a man in my life that I would trust with the depths of my soul that he might not use it later to turn on me, amen. No, no, be very careful what you say to each other. Notice what verses four and five say though. He says this, he said, I sinned. He said, have I sinned? Yes. Verse five, I was shapen in iniquity. Sin did my mother conceive me. So he's saying this, he says, I'm making no excuses. I'm accepting my just lot. I did it. I did it. Now look at verse number six. He gets into something that's important. He said, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. In other words, go into my soul and help me understand what lies hidden deep within me. Search me, try me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. In plain words, it gets into the motive of the heart. Why did you do it? Think about this. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only the Lord can know. I don't know my own heart. And you don't either. God's the only one that can try the reins and search the heart. God will help you. Many sins are symptoms of a much greater problem that may lie hidden in the heart. That's one to meditate on. Many sins are simply symptoms of a much greater problem that lies deep within the soul. This is why he said, search me and try me. There are broken hearts. You ever met a broken heart? Oh yes, I've met broken hearts. Could a broken heart person sin? Oh yes, they could. What about a bruised heart? Someone that's been treated badly, kicked down, then stomped while they were down. They say of the Baptist church, <coughs> and I'm sure other fundamentalists, that we kill our wounded. Have you ever heard that term before? Oh yeah. And let me tell you something. If you find someone who's messed up and you want to put them down, you're doing that to lift yourself up, period. It's not that you're condoning anything, but you're lifting yourself up because you're comparing yourself with someone else. And that gives you this assurance. Well, I didn't do that. But the truth of the matter is, for all have sinned. The Apostle Paul said, of all the sinners, I'm chief. You have to understand it in the right way. Let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There's a wicked heart. I can think of one named Jezebel. There's another one named Athaliah. There are others in the Bible with wicked hearts. I mean wicked, vile hearts. I wouldn't say that Ahab had a wicked heart, but he had a wicked wife. And that wicked wife led him into a wicked, uh, what he did was wicked, to Naboth. Then there's rebellious heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I've rebelled against God a few times. Amen. Yeah, you're looking, looking at somebody that has rebelled against God. I knew the will of God and didn't do it. God told me something was wrong, went ahead and did it anyway. And you know what I did when I did it? The Holy Ghost wouldn't give me any peace. Now that's the good part. See, when you're born again, the Holy Ghost is going to work on your soul. That's the good thing. That's just what Romans, uh, the, the, the Hebrews chapter number 12 is talking about. Every son I receive, I scourge, I chasten. The Holy Spirit will let you know when you've done something, said something, been somewhere that's wrong. So you have an ignorant heart. Look at Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 9. Romans chapter number seven and verse number nine. Would you look at this now and meditate, meditate on what I'm reading to you. Romans chapter number seven and verse number nine. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, who wrote this? Saul of Tarsus. He said at the feet of Gamaliel. He was under the law every day of his life, but there was a time that he didn't know the law. He was a child. He was growing up, you see. And here's what happened now. Look at this. I was alive without it once, but when the commandment came, in other words, I understood it, embraced it, received it, sin revived and I died. There we go. What's that? That is an ignorant heart. Look at Romans chapter number two. The apostle Paul, when he wrote the book of Romans, covered a lot of what you would say are nuances that have to do with your relationship with God, what you understand. Romans chapter number two and verse number 14, look at this. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their, what? Conscience, also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So, we have a situation here where you, we, have, we have ignorance. And here's what Paul said about ignorance in 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 13. Look at this, quite a remarkable statement. He said, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it, how? Ignorantly in unbelief. He's admitting right off the bat that the law was unable to bring you, give you the real lowdown, the absolute truth. It could only point you to the one to get to give you the truth. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the apostle Paul said, I was ignorant, an ignorant heart, but that goes further. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Not only can you have an ignorant heart, you can have a blinded heart. You see, blind, blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Now let me tell you something, folks. I'll be honest with you tonight, really. Some of the things that I'm giving you, I'm simply scratching the surface and throwing them out there for you to take home and meditate on. I am in no way getting into the depths of what it means and the application of it in the New Testament. These are powerful scriptures that I'm giving you. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God, should shine to them. Who blinds them? The God of this world. What's he do? He blinds them to what? The gospel. Notice carefully. 
unless the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine. So that makes the gospel of Christ very, very, very important. Now look at this one. Look at Romans chapter number 11 and verse number seven. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. This is not the same blinding that you just read about in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Notice John 12, verse 37. Do you remember the believe is the theme that runs through the gospel of John? The word believe shows up more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke put together. Believe. Verse number 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Now watch carefully what you're reading. That the saying of Esaias, this is Isaiah the prophet, and he's quoting Isaiah 6. Now look at this. The saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now watch verse 39. Take that home and pray over it. You're about to read something that is powerful. Look at it. Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. That's strong stuff right there. So what do you mean, preacher? I'm telling you the Bible is God's word, and it applies to every human being that has ever lived or ever will live on the face of this earth. We're all accountable to God, every last one of us. Nobody can crawl off and say, you know, that I'm not accountable. You're all accountable. But God Almighty is the judge that you're accountable to. And you believe this, as he said to Abraham, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? He will. So now you have, I've given, just introduced you to some things that makes that should make you think. Because I read stuff like this and go back over it and meditate over it and read it again, think about it, read it again, think about it, read it again, pray over it and say, God, give me light into it. And uh, I'll read 15 or 20, a thousand commentaries and still go back and say, Lord, give me light on it. You'll be amazed at, the, at some of the most brilliant men that have ever lived that disagree with each other. Keep that in mind. That's important. I'm talking about men who have dedicated their lives to the study of the Bible, and they have earned all the degrees possible. Masters of Hebrew and Greek, Latin, many of them, and, uh, and yet they don't agree with each other. You know why? Because the Bible is the Word of God, and it is a living book. Look at the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 3, and verse 5. Now let's look at Solomon. I gave you all of that to lay the ground, the foundation of what it is, as David's life was. He was a warrior. He loved God. He was the sweet psalmist. He wrote many of the psalms singing and praising God. That's what David did. He had a sense of love for the Lord. It was one of the most remarkable things. I do not for one minute question David's love for God because he repented. That showed he loved God. He didn't repent because of what he thought might be done to him. He repented because he said, I've sinned against you, Lord. I've broken your heart. Look at all you've done for me, what you've given me, where you brought me from. And look what I did. God, forgive me. I think the 53rd, 51st Psalm can be read with tears, crying and weeping. David was crying and weeping when he wrote that. Now look at 1 Kings chapter number 3 and verse number 5. This is his son. 1 Kings 3, 5. Here's what it says. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. God said, ask what I shall give thee. Has the Lord ever appeared to you? He's a chosen vessel. Solomon had a blessed encounter with God. He doesn't appear to everybody, but he appeared to Solomon. He chose him, set him apart. He was about to do something for Solomon that had never been done to him by anybody before that. He was about to give Solomon the wisdom of God. What a gift. Look at verse number nine, 1 Kings chapter three. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this day thy great a people? I believe this is as genuine coming from the soul of Solomon as it could be. He wanted to help his people. He wanted to be a good king. And he knew that this wisdom can only come from God. I'm not interested in the wisdom of this world. Good night, man. I've watched this world go upside down a dozen times since I was 17 years old. And look where it is now. Are you kidding? Well, they're insane. If you look for any wisdom out here, you, you've gone bonkers. These people are idiots. So you go back to the Bible. You go back to the wisdom of God. You remember what Paul, what John said, that which is highly esteemed among men is a what? 
was abomination to God. He said, give me this, please, Lord. Give me a discerning heart. Well, then in verse number 12, 1 Kings 3, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Only one Solomon. He had uh, so much wisdom and had so much fame. The Queen of Sheba, you know all about her. She came, viewed the sitting of his servants and the money and this and that and all the rest of it. She said, the half has not been told. So she returned to her country. And it was something in those days. It even lists some of the men that Solomon was much wiser than. Some of the wise men for their era. And Solomon was so much wiser than they were. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 9 and verse number 13. The scripture says, the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Translate that to today, tons of gold. I saw one website that tried to decipher this and said it is worth over three trillion dollars in today's money. Unbelievably wealthy. So God gave to Solomon because of his simple prayer that he wanted to help his people. He answered the prayer, then he gave him riches untold, and he gave him wisdom. He appeared to him. So has not Solomon therefore been given privilege? Sure he has. Solomon has been given privilege beyond measure. Absolutely, he's been given this privilege. He had a kingdom handed to him. His father David was a warrior, and it took his father David to unite the 12 tribes of Israel. And the only time they ever stayed united was under David, because under Solomon they wound up splitting apart again. And 10 tribes went to the north and two, sa two stayed in the south. David was the only one that could pull Israel together, all 12 tribes. Of course, David is a type of Christ too, in that his kingdom. You see, we introduced types tonight. This is where I'm gonna get into you, get into Solomon with you. What's a type? A type is a person, a thing, an event, or something of that nature that looks forward to something into the future. It may have elements that are so plain that you can't overlook it about what's going to happen. But it also has people who are prefiguring someone who is to come. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me. So therefore, Moses is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about that first Adam? Was he a type of Christ? Of course he was. He was a type of Christ, first Adam. Because every one of us in this house tonight, we've got the first Adam's DNA in our body because he's our father. If he's not your father, where'd you come from? Are you one of these aliens that dropped in on us? If you're a human being sitting in here tonight, Adam was your father. But you see, the Lord Jesus is called the last Adam. What's that mean? Well, the first Adam is the beginner of a whole race or a whole entity of mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ being the last Adam is the beginner, he's the source. And it's very important because we don't have time to get into all that tonight, but there will be nothing alive in the future that relates to mankind that did not come from that last Adam. And that's going to come. So the first Adam is a type of Christ. Noah was a type of Christ. Took them from the old world into the new world. These types teach lessons. You cannot use a type to absolutely establish doctrine, but you can use a type to support doctrine that's been revealed in the scripture. You say, why are you saying all of this? Because Solomon's a type of something. For the first part of his life, he was a decent man. He was a wealthy man, a wise man. He loved the Lord, served the Lord. It's as plain as it can be. One hypocrite. Solomon was real, no question about it. So we're looking at someone who was part of the Lord's family, the family of the Lord. You know, Israel. He was an Israelite, no question about that. But something happened to Solomon, and notice what the Bible does when it happens. Look at 2 Chronicles 9, 13 again. Don't you look at this. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 606, three score is what? Six and six talents of gold. We got three sixes here, six, six, six. Now you don't suppose the writer of Second Chronicles had any idea about Revelation chapter 13, do you? That the mark of the beast and the number of his name was 666, of course not. But he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what you got. See, this is another one of those things in the Bible that say, that's God's word. This man couldn't have done that. This is inspiration. This is thousands of years before the other showed up. This is inspiration. It's God's word, and it is. The steps leading up to his throne, six. In other words, six is written all over Solomon. So what do you mean then, preacher? Solomon becomes a type of the Antichrist. That's what he is. 
is a type of the Antichrist. Another way to say it is pseudo-Christos, or false Christ. The Bible talks about the Lord's anointed. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power, baptized him, Holy Ghost came on him, and he was anointed there in the Jordan River. But he said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. The mystery of iniquity doth now already work, and he who letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Solomon started from the very seat and heart of those who believed God, who trusted God. That makes him far, far more deceptive than some secular being that came in from the outside, like Nebuchadnezzar, for example, Belshazzar, Rabshakeh, or some of them. You heard about one Sunday, he was talking about that when it killed 185,000 of Sinatra's troops. One angel of the Lord. What, what do you learn from that? Don't mess with angels, amen. <laughs> Solomon, therefore, rising up from the midst of where truth and revelation and the knowledge of God and remember this, pagan did not have the knowledge of God like the Israelite had. To them were given the oracles of God. They were the ones writing scripture. Now, many of the pagans had a knowledge of God, but not the knowledge of God revealed in the Bible. Understand? And so Solomon becomes a type of the Antichrist. Then we need to look at what that means. What are the ramifications of that? What is an apostate? I read this off the internet today and I've read a lot of different definitions of apostasy, but this is one of the best I've read. Apostasy is a damning sin because it is a total rejection of Christ. No one who claims to be a Christian wakes up one morning and suddenly decides to become an apostate. Instead, it is a slow, gradual drift over time where the heart becomes harder, the conscience more calloused, and the sensitivity to the things of God numbed. That was good, that's why I chose that. Do we have apostates today standing in the pulpits in this country? better believe we do. They deny the virgin birth. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the inspiration of scriptures. They deny the real power and essence of sin. They deny all the cardinal things that matter. They deny the incarnation of Christ. Now look what the apostle John said about this. Go over here to 1 John with me and we'll get an idea. 1 John chapter number two, he puts things together in a, in a, in a, in a kind of a understandable way. Now look what he says in verse 18, 1 John 2, 18. Little children, you remember I told you the book of 1 John was written to believers. Little children, little children. It is the last time, and as you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Now watch this. Even now are there what? Many Antichrist. What does that mean? Well, he gives some definition of the following. But the bottom line is with John, there are many out there who are against Christ. That's what an antichrist is. He's against him. Well, wait a minute. Imagine the pulpit open the Bible. Pre yeah, but he could be a antichrist because he cherry picks what he's going to preach. Let me say this tonight, and I hope that you understand what I mean. Nothing is as important as to understand the true nature and character of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is primary. If we don't get him right, I don't care anything about the rest of it. You can get into every movement, you can get into this, you can get into that, that's meaningless. The Lord Jesus Christ is primary, he's everything. We've got to get him right, we've got to know who he is, we've got to know where he came from, we've got to know what he did at the cross, we've got to know where he went, that's it. I declare to you the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle said, and here's what he said, verse one, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Now here it is, and it's a simple thing. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For, now he's going to define it. For I delivered rather unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He didn't die a martyr's death according to the scriptures and that he was buried, so he really died, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died, was buried, and rose again the third day. You wouldn't believe how many people I've asked that simple question. Now, watch this with John. Look at 1 John 2, verse 22. Who is a liar? And John likes to use the word liar because in 1 John, 1 John chapter number one, he said, if you say you have not sinned, you call God a liar. Who is a liar? Well, he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Anointed One, the Christ. He is Antichrist. Now watch this, look how he does this. That denieth the Father and the Son. If you deny the Son, 
you've denied the Father. You cannot bypass the Son and say you believe in the Father. You may believe intellectually, but you don't know Him. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. There's no way you can know the Father without knowing the Son. You see what I mean? And this is what's important about it. You denied the Father and the Son. 1 John 4, 3. Every spirit, now look at this, he goes to the spirits. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. What is that? That's God in flesh. You see, he's denied the Father and the Son. He connects them together. Then he said in verse number three, if you say, if you confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, not of God, and this is, now this is what's important about this. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Now let's stop for just a moment. How many Solomons do we have right now in the pulpits? In the beginning, they started right, okay? They started right, but somewhere they apostatized. And when they apostatized, they did exactly what Solomon did. There's two Solomons. There's the Solomon before, then there's the Solomon after. And that thing over there in Chronicles, which talks about 666, is talking about the Solomon after. Because the women that he had married, brought in there, and formed his harem, turned his heart away from God. There are men standing in the pulpit, and you'll never get them to confess it. But they have long since given up on the doctrine of the virgin birth, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the inspiration of scriptures, the cardinal truths that we preach. The professing church in America is one of the most apostate, dead places on this earth. It's horrible as to how bad it has gotten. Two days ago, the Germans apparently published or were published, and I've got it from, I got it from uh, YouTube or Google. They are working on taking a dead body and bringing it back to life. And, and, and raising it essentially from the dead scientifically. So what does that mean? That means that you're on the very cusp of what this Bible talks about when it says that the deadly wound was healed and this, 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 uh, this beast that rise up out of the sea, Revelation 13, smitten in the head, it dies, but the deadly wound is healed. He's brought back to life. And the world says, who can make war against the beast? And of course, they can't. At that time, they can't because they don't have any power to make war against the beast because they're there to receive his mark. The professing church in this country, make no mistake about it, get ready because I don't think you are. I believe you people love the Lord and you love the Bible. You love his word. But I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to take his mark and they're going to support the Antichrist and they're going to be part of the great apostasy. And once the church has done it, then the rest of the world will fall right in place. No problem, because that's where it's coming from. What a sad thing. I'm not going to name a name tonight, but there's a young man who has built one of these mega churches. And you can see some of the worship service, that's what you want to call it, up on stage, they're jerking and they're rolling. and they're, It's just like going into some kind of a secular theater. All this junk's going on on the stage and they're just giving it this and this. And that's supposed to be worship. Well, the one that is leading this says, well, you know, I'm not so sure about the virgin birth. And he says, you know, the Bible is written, it's an ancient book written by a bunch of old men thousands of years ago. I mean, really, how relevant is it for us today? And then homosexuality, you know, I mean, what's, what's you know, we, who are we to judge someone else? And down the list he goes. And everything that you believe tonight, he just throws it out the window. Yet he's a Christian, quote unquote, pastoring a mega church. And there are many, 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 many little mega churches, little megas. <laughs> they want to be like the big mega. And they learn from the big mega how to build the kingdom of God on this earth. He said, upon this rock, I will build my country, movement, kingdom, denomination. Or did he not say, upon this rock, I will build my church, which is made up of Englishmen, Italians, French, Portuguese, Africans, Swedish, Canadians. In other words, all of mankind makes up his church. That's what he's doing right now. When he comes back, according to Revelation 11, he'll come back and take that which rightfully belongs to him that Satan offered to him in Luke 4. He'll come back and take the kingdoms of this world and they will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Glory to God. So it would behoove you tonight to be certain 
that you're a member of that body of Christ of born again believers that loves the Lord Jesus Christ that judges everything, everybody, anything or any period, any movement, you judge it all by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you judge it, preacher? If it does not exalt, if it does not lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, it's part of that other 666 that shows up in the book of Daniel in the plains of Dura. You remember that one? Nebuchadnezzar had an image raised up and the measurements of that image, 666. And what did that image represent? It represented the Gentile kingdoms from 606 BC until that kingdom, that stone cut out of a mountain comes down and smites it on its feet and destroys it. And, and it rolls up in, in, in pieces and is blown away by the wind. That's the second coming of Christ. And he's gonna come and he's gonna do it. And he's gonna take it and it belongs to him. And if, I, am I, if I'm here when he does it or if I'm gone beforehand, if I'm here when he does it, hallelujah. If I'm gone beforehand, see you when he's come, because I'll be coming with him, amen. We're going to take this world. You're going to take it. It belongs to him. He bought and paid for it. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth right now, Romans 8, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And they're coming. Hallelujah, they're coming. And I am, by the grace of God, reached down into a dark... You know something? You ever think of it like this? I was in a dark pit. Okay, I was in a dark pit when God found me. No human being could have found me in that dark pit because they couldn't see me. But the Holy Ghost knew exactly where to go to. Take me by the hand and bring me right out of it. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? if you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.